The good cop, bad cop routine? Not exactly. Let me ask you something. What's the difference between this scene? I don't, I don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? And this one. You two have so much in common. Masked Avengers. Or this other one. Look at you. Your mask is amazing. I wish you could have seen me in mine. Well, all three scenes are interrogations between Batman and the villain of the moment but they're very different from each other. They're only as good as the world allows them to be. I'll show you. When the chips are down, these, uh, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. Nolan's Joker and Bruce share a conversation that's practically a philosophical debate. The only sensible way to live in this world is without rules. And tonight you're gonna break your one rule. And like the other scenes, the central theme here is identity. You are complete. Me. Although in this case, we're not delving as much into the character's psychology. Instead, each of them represents an idea. So you're gonna have to play my little game if you want to save one of them. And Joker's ultimate goal is to show how his nemesis's ideals can be broken. Nothing to threaten me with. Nothing to do with all of your strength. On the other hand, the exchange in Reeves' film is more of a psychological introspection. This is very upsetting to you. Let's get back to him. Why? You are so much more fun. I'm not here to talk about me. Bruce comes in seeking information, but in the end, he's the one who ends up being interrogated, because Reeves' Joker isn't trying to break Batman's philosophy, but rather his psychology. You're just terrified. Because you're not sure he's wrong, huh? You think they deserve it. Of course this scene is just a teaser, so we only get glimpses of the character, but it fits well with the movie's impressionistic, subjective approach, where the camera constantly tries to place us in Bruce's perspective. In this case, the blurred figure gives us an image of a Joker who is hard to look at, not the cool, calculated Joker of Nolan's films. And while the Riddler is pathetic, this Joker is terrifying, and in terms of appearance, so meticulous, unsettling. But what I find smart about this scene is how it also revisits the theme of identity, as it's the central theme of the film, and in this case, it's approached as an element of tension on multiple levels. Who oh, is he? First, with who Riddler truly is. He's a nobody. Wants to be somebody. Second, with Bruce's own psychology. I want to know how he thinks. You know exactly how he thinks. And third, and most importantly, the suspense lies in the visual reveal of Joker's complete character. And the same will happen in the scene with the Riddler, where it's not really a confrontation or a psychological interrogation, but more of a mirror. All everyone wants to do is unmask you, but they're missing the point. And today, I want to dive deeper into that. But before we get into that breakdown, I want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, War Thunder, the ultimate free-to-play military game where you command everything, from tanks and jets to naval ships in epic battles. And the best part? Not only is it free, but it's also available on PC, PlayStation, Xbox, and Mac. After trying it out, I can say what makes this game stand out is the variety and realism. Because you can battle on land, sea, and air with a wide range of vehicles from early 20th century tanks to modern military tech, and fully customize them to create your own style. It almost feels like you're crafting your own war machine, with game dynamics that make it feel like real combat. For example, there are no health bars here, so one well-placed hit can change everything. Add in realistic physics, immersive graphics, and highly detailed environments from all around the world, from Alaska to Africa. And it's like stepping into a Hollywood blockbuster. Plus, the new Dance of Dragons update brings even more vehicles, like a whole line of French combat boats, the British Missile System, Stormer Air Defense, and the tactical bomber F-111, or this two top-tier Chinese fighter jets. The J-10A and the JF-17. So if that sounds like your kind of action, Download War Thunder for free from the link in the description. And the cool part is that all new players, and those who haven't played War Thunder for six months or more, will receive the awesome bonuses you see on the screen. Big thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Now let's go back to the video. When I mention that the interrogation glass works almost like a mirror, I think it's an idea the movie visually establishes in a few moments, because it constantly draws parallels between the two, from small details like how they both jot down their thoughts in their journals as masked orphans, to how they're introduced 
Each of them takes their vengeance in the same way during their first appearance. Both are captured in very similar low-angle shots. Bruce, a wealthy man, exacts his vengeance against a marginalized criminal, while the Riddler, a marginalized criminal, takes his vengeance on a wealthy man. In both shots, the camera captures them from below, and there is a sense of satisfaction in their body language once they accomplish their goal, as if vengeance makes them grow larger and brings them into a state of ecstasy. And there are so many similarities between the two that the film draws them from the very first shot. Which is a brilliant introduction, because instead of starting with a typical opening, the movie does the exact opposite. The first thing we see is this mysterious point of view, and we have no idea who it belongs to. At first, we might think it's Bruce, but soon enough, this strange perspective focuses on a child dressed as a vigilante, playing inside a mansion. And naturally, we might connect this kid to a young Bruce and assume it's him. Obviously, the image is deliberately ambiguous and unsettling, but it really puts us in the shoes of this unknown observer, and the sound lets us hear his heavy breathing. And it's a shot that pretty much captures all the key elements of the film. There is an orphan tied to the color red, dressed as a masked hero who loses a father figure important to the city. There are also other details like the constant religious imagery, with Ave Maria playing and nuns walking by, or the futility of authority, represented by a guard who will prove useless later that same night. But the most important thing it hints at is what we don't see on screen the Observer. A voyeur watching the city from afar, just like Bruce does. And the film wants to make this so clear that it later recreates the exact same shot in a mirrored scene. Even the composition of the frames is the same. The characters being observed are two orphans sharing the screen with a loved one, who will be killed within a few hours. And they are being watched by two other orphans who view the city from their skewed perspectives. And this visual idea will come back later, once again mirroring shots from the perspective of another orphan, this time Selena. And it's no coincidence that, once again, these are shots where the focus is all about the gaze. Are you sure no one can see these things in my eyes? Don't worry. I'm watching you. I think this is a very powerful scene because it's about Bruce discovering a new reality through her gaze, to the point where the camera literally puts us in her eyes. And there are more than a few intense looks that really make us feel what it's like to be in her shoes. These guys have a little problem with eye contact, don't they? Feels good, doesn't it? This becomes even more powerful when you realize the movie is always trying to put us in Bruce's perspective, sometimes using super close-up shots of his world, but especially through subjective shots that reaffirm his point of view, in both its detective scenes, as well as its action sequences and dramatic moments. It's over. And that's no accident, because if you think about it, Bruce's entire journey is really about discovering different perspectives. It's a serial killer. It's partly why I like the scene with the Joker. I want your perspective. Although, personally, I wouldn't have included it, as it makes the film's message a bit too explicit. You two have so much in common. But the thing is... Was it worth it? Compromising yourself for money? Bruce's problem is that he's so wrapped up in himself and stuck in his past that he can't see beyond his own point of view. And this not only leads him to make mistakes in his conclusions, I think I'm his last arc. But the movie also portrays Bruce as quite naive, and in a way, immature. You have to keep up appearances. You're still a Wayne. <laughs> what about you? You're Wayne? If you notice, the only times he smiles in the entire movie are here and in this other shot. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. Balcone owes me that money. He owes you. Yeah. And in both, you can see how Pattinson adds an extra layer of depth to the character by making his smiles almost full of contempt or superiority, to the point where he almost breaks his Batman persona in front of Selena. And the interesting thing is that the movie really emphasizes how wrong he is. I want to know why a guy like Falcone would owe you anything. Because he's my father! Because even though he's the world's greatest detective, this younger version still needs to learn more about the world and the society he's part of. I didn't help my daughter when she needed it. I can tell you that. Guy was just another rich scum sucker. And that's why two of the most important scenes in the movie are about something as simple as Bruce confronting new perspectives that make him change his own, like the climax, and of course, the interrogation scene. This particular scene is great because, as I mentioned, it works on several levels. First, we finally uncover the Riddler's complete identity. I've been invisible my whole life. I guess I won't be anymore, will I? Then, identity is used as a kind of weapon. Bruce. 
building tension because at times we think it's being used against the protagonist. Boy. But then we realize that Riddler doesn't know Bruce is Batman. He's the only one we didn't get. And identity takes on a new dimension. This time, we get a glimpse of what the experience of a real orphan is like. Living in some tower over the park isn't being an orphan. And I think including a scene that exposes your protagonist this much is a daring move, as the Riddler essentially roasts Bruce with the usual pop culture criticisms directed at the Batman icon. Let's talk about the billionaire with the lying dead daddy because at least the money makes it go down easy, doesn't it? But what's smart is that instead of ignoring them or trying to counter them, your friend got involved with the wrong people. She didn't know any better. Maybe you should have explained it to her. This movie embraces those flaws, making the character even more compelling. You know, whoever the hell you are, you obviously grew up rich. I mean, lines like these can be a bit on the nose, but I think they make sense because this version is really brave for humbling such an admired character, showing us a flawed, erratic human who, in my opinion, is much more interesting. Oh, you're really not as smart as I thought you were. I guess I gave you too much credit. In a way, the movie almost serves as a response to superhero films in general, showing that brute force and willpower alone aren't enough. You need to understand the root of the problems to truly change the system. Otherwise, you might end up doing more harm than good. What did we just do? I asked you to bring him the light, and you did. We're such a good team. We're not a team. Especially coming from someone who's supposed to be one of the few people in the city capable of bringing real change. You know, you really could be doing more for this city. Your family has a history of philanthropy, but as far as I can tell, you're not doing anything. This theme comes up in his conversations with the new mayor, and it's explored in comics like War on Crime, where even Bruce himself wonders if, in a different context, he might have channeled all his anger over losing his parents into a life of crime. There, he also reflects on the fact that, sure, being that man is great, but if he really wants to make a difference, he has to use his influence as Bruce Wayne, too. And maybe that's something we'll see in a future film, since that conversation plants the seed for it. Especially with how this movie ends, because by the time it reaches the climax, it definitely offers its own take on what it means to be that man. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. What are you? In the Burton movie, I remember it was such an exciting moment when that guy says, you know, who are you? And he says, I'm Batman. That was such a definitive moment. The hell are you supposed to be? Somewhere early in the writing, I came up with this idea of him not saying, I'm Batman. I'm vengeance. Recently, I uploaded a video talking about the history of the Dark Knight in cinema. I'm Batman. Because I was trying to compare the different cinematic versions of Batman and how each one is portrayed in its own unique way. Burton's version is a Baroque, theatrical madman, framed like a painting. Nolan's is an idealized neoclassical hero. Nice go rising with epic music and golden light as people look up to him, while Snyder's Batman is more of a brutal, disturbed demigod, terrifying the police and escaping like a beast across rooftops. And then there's Reeves, who presents his Batman as a grounded, real-world vigilante. And when he says his name, the response is not what we expect. He's fighting a stranger as if they have personally harmed him. Him. And I always just get the impression that he just wants to keep recreating the night where his parents died. All the fights seem very personal. And this isn't a minor detail because, essentially, Bruce's journey is a search for identity. And maybe he doesn't answer that he's Batman because, at that point, he might not be there yet. Who the hell are you? That's why, during the climax, we hear that line again. I'm vengeance. But the thing is, if both are vengeance, then what sets them apart? Well, the answer comes just seconds later when Bruce sacrifices his life in a moment that many might think falls outside the realistic logic of the film. But to me, it makes perfect sense because it becomes a chain of symbols where vengeance dies, leading to the birth of a new identity. What is the Batman? And this idea of death and rebirth shows up on several levels. If you close your eyes and listen to the soundtrack, you can hear how the vengeance theme evolves. Now, more epic and uplifting, but fundamentally with bells ringing. And it certainly makes even more sense if you take into account that Reeves uses religious imagery throughout the movie. Oh my God. 
because in Christian tradition, those bells often symbolize death or baptism. That's why once Bruce solidifies his new identity, he ends up submerged in water, going through a process of purification, just like the city, which undergoes its own kind of flood, almost like a biblical deluge. It's the birth of the Batman, followed by his baptism, transforming him from a frightening figure Please don't hurt me. into one that brings light. He lets go of the idea of that I am the shadows and instead becomes a light of hope that guides the way. And it's no accident that the first thing he does after this rebirth is reach out to take the mayor's son's hand. This isn't the first time he saves the boy. Showing something beyond vengeance, empathy. After all, both of them have experienced the same kind of loss, and the boy is a reflection of Bruce, allowing us to relive his trauma and the night that changed his life forever. His presence is a recurring motif throughout the movie, and in a way it encapsulates Bruce's journey, because every scene where the boy appears works like a little snapshot of Bruce's life. First, there's the loss, then the funeral in the church, which is so powerful because it represents the eternal mourning Bruce is stuck in, and finally, the rebirth, almost like Bruce is saving himself. And ultimately, his final consolidation is once again built on the gaze of others. If at first he was seen as a freak, now he is viewed as a hero people turn to for refuge. Not only does he see reality differently, but reality also sees him differently. And maybe that's what the Batman comes to remind us, that sometimes, we just need to change the lens through which we view reality. 